Right, so on to disseminated intravascular coagulation, or DIC. Let us first start by defining the name. Disseminated means having spread throughout the body. Intravascular means within the blood vessels, and coagulation means clot formation. So this means that there is a clot formation, or there's a clot forming, within the blood vessels throughout the body. DIC is defined as the pathological activation of the coagulation cascade. This leads to both micro and macro thrombi forming, as well as a deficiency in the clotting factors causing a bleeding state. The causes of DIC can be remembered using the mnemonic stop making new thrombi. So these include sepsis, trauma, obstetric complications, acute pancreatitis, malignancies, nephrotic syndrome, and transfusions. Let us now discuss the pathophysiology of DIC. DIC arises due to the pathological systemic activation of coagulation. Now this can be activated by either the release of a procoagulant material, for example, tissue factor, or by the means of cytokine pathways, so inflammation. So let us consider the pathway. We have widespread intravascular coagulation. This is caused by either the coagulation pathway or platelet aggregation. The causes of these have previously been discussed, but we shall discuss specific causes later. Intravascular coagulation leads to three things. First, fibrin production. When fibrin is continuously being produced, you end up using all of the coagulation factors faster than they are produced, so these begin to decline. Second, micro and macrovascular thrombus formation. If you remember from our video on the pathway of secondary hemostasis, every time a thrombus is formed, the fibrinolysis pathway is activated. So we have activation of fibrinolysis. Fibrin production also activates fibrinolysis. And third, platelet consumption, which leads to a thrombocytopenia. Decreased coagulation factors and thrombocytopenia mean bleeding cannot be controlled. Fibrinolysis also causes the production of fibrinogen degradation products, which can be measured. The two hallmarks of DIC are continuous generation of intravascular fibrin and depletion of platelets. If you have forgotten about secondary hemostasis, you might want to check out our secondary hemostasis video to refresh your memory. So let us recap. Something causes activation of the coagulation pathway and platelet aggregation. This leads to widespread intravascular coagulation. This in turn leads to, first, fibrin production, which consumes coagulation factors, causing them to decline. This can cause bleeding. Second, micro and macrovascular thrombus, which activates fibrinolysis, which in turn form fibrinogen degradation products. Don't forget fibrin also activates fibrinolysis. And third, platelet consumption, leading to thrombocytopenia, which can also cause bleeding. So what does this mean clinically? Well, widespread microthrombi can cause ischemia and infarction, leading to multi-organ failure, and consumption of factors and platelets leads to bleeding. You can see this bleeding everywhere, from bleeding through the IV lines, mucocutaneous bleeding such as purpura and echismosis, hemoptysis, hematuria. Patients can also have intracerebral bleeding. The three important organs that are involved are the skin, so you can see bruising and echismosis, the brain, patients can present and suffer from a stroke, TIA or hemorrhage, and the kidneys, where patients can present with an AKI or renal failure. But don't forget, every single organ can be affected. So we've discussed the clinical features, but just to recap, Bleeding is the key feature because due to the lack of platelets and factors,
bleeding cannot be controlled, so there is failure of the coagulation pathway. Patients usually present acutely ill and shocked. Clinical features really depends on which part of the body has been involved. Indeed, it can be the entire body. Here are some clinical features that you should know of and keep an eye out for. Patients can present with an AKI, oliguria, hematuria, cough, hemoptysis, delirium, coma, hypertension, tachycardia, thrombi causing gangrene, and patients can also be septic if this is the cause of the DIC. So this is not an exhaustive list. There are many, many other clinical features that can present, and it really depends on the clinical scenario. Always think of the cause of DIC. That might elucidate some of the clinical features. So if you think, for example, if a patient presents with new onset of um, bleeding through their lines, or they present with echismosis or purpura, then you can think of um, DIC as a differential or any pathology that results from intravascular thrombosis, such as stroke and MI, you can also think of DIC. It is the combination of the clinical features with the investigations that we shall uh, see shortly um, that will give you a definitive diagnosis of DIC. So DIC can be acute or chronic. Most commonly, it is acute. Acute DIC presents acutely with generalized bleeding and micro or macrovascular thrombus formation. This leads to hypotension, infarction, and multi-organ failure. Chronic DIC is subacute, and patients usually present with diffuse thrombosis. Causes of acute DIC include trauma, massive transfusions, sepsis, and obstetric complications, whereas causes of chronic DIC include malignancies, and autoimmune conditions. Let us now discuss the pathophysiology of specific causes of DIC to help you understand this. We'll start with sepsis. So if you remember from your microbiology, gram-negative bacteria contain endotoxins. Endotoxins are part of the cell wall. These are also called lipopolysaccharides, or LPS. We can see here in this picture we have a gram-negative bacterium, and in red we have the LPS. The LPS is released into circulation due to a number of reasons, including bacterial death. Macrophages recognize this and produce cytokines including IL-1, 6, and TNF. These can trigger the coagulation cascade and result in DIC. Obstetric complications can also cause DIC. The reason for this is that amniotic fluid contains thromboplastin. This is also called tissue factor. And if you remember from our secondary hemostasis video, tissue factor activates the extrinsic pathway with factor 7. So retrograde flow of the amniotic fluid can cause DIC. The important malignancy that causes DIC is acute promyelocytic leukemia which is the M3 subtype of acute myeloid leukemia. Now we discussed leukemia in the hematological malignancy series, but let us quickly describe what is happening here. APML results from translocation 1517. This causes disruption of the retinoic acid receptor. Therefore, cells do not mature and promyelocytes accumulate. Myeloperoxidase, or MPO, in the cytoplasm of these premature cells crystallize and form what is known as our rods. So what we have here is a promyelocyte, which are granulocyte precursors, and these have large nuclei. Within the cytoplasm we see our rods. If these rods are released into circulation somehow, they cause DIC. So what you need to know is that APML is the M3 subtype of acute myeloid leukemia. It is a cancer that occurs in adults. This leukemia contains cells that contain our rods. These rods can cause DIC. Let us consider the following investigations. The platelet count would be low as platelets aggregate and we have a thrombocytopenia. The PT, APTT, and TCT would all be increased. 
This is because factors are being consumed rapidly, quicker than they are being produced, so patients have a diminished factor count. Fibrinogen is decreased. Remember, fibrinogen is factor 1, and so this is also rapidly consumed. D-dimer is increased. Remember, these are the products of fibrinolysis, and we have activation of the fibrinolytic system in DIC. You should also consider doing specific investigations depending on the clinical scenario. This is to determine the cause of DIC. These investigations include investigations for cancer, sepsis, and obstetric complications. There are a spectrum of other investigations that you can consider doing. Again, these all depend on the clinical scenario. If you were to do a full blood count, what type of anemia do you think you would find? Have a think about this. Hopefully you understood that you would get a microangiopathic hemolytic anemia. And the reason for this, to describe again, is that we have a thrombus within a small vessel. Red blood cells try to squeeze through and end up being sliced in half, forming schistocytes. So on a blood film, we would find schistocytes. The treatment of DIC is mainly supportive. The key features that you need to address include hypoxia, acidosis, and organ failure. Patients develop acidosis because cells become ischemic as they are deprived of oxygen due to the intravascular thrombosis. So these cells convert their metabolism to anaerobic respiration and thus produce lactic acid. The important thing is to treat the underlying disorder as treating this will take care of the DIC. You should also consider, under specialist guidance, the use of platelet, cryoprecipitate, FFP, and fibrinogen concentrate transfusions. Again, these should be done under specialist guidance. You should be careful though, as rapid transfusion of these blood products can cause hypotension. Importantly, you should never use antifibrinolytics, such as tranexamic acid, in acute DIC, as this can result in fatal fibrin deposition. Antifibrinolytics might be used in chronic DIC, but this is under specialist guidance. Depending on the clinical scenario and under specialist guidance, if a patient presents predominantly with active bleeding, you can consider transfusions of blood products, FFP, and cryoprecipitate. If a patient presents predominantly with thrombosis, you can consider heparin. Again, these should only be considered under specialist guidance. I must emphasize this.